Welcome at the Icometrics webinar on insights in artificial intelligence and trying to bridge the gap from research uh, to making really clinical impact with AI in radiology. Today's uh, webinar will be presented by Dr. Saurabh Jain and Dr. Lawrence Tannenbaum. Uh, and just as a background, uh, before uh, presenting our uh, fantastic speakers, uh, I shortly want to introduce Icometrics and our product Icobrain to you. Icometrics is a company with headquarters in Leuven, Belgium, and also having an office in Chicago in the US. It was founded in 2011, and in the meantime, it has grown to a team of 45 people. And we are driven uh, to try to transform patient care by the use of imaging AI. So uh, that is also a close relationship with today's webinar. So today we have uh, a product on the market called IcoBrain, which is CE marked and FDA cleared, and, con uh, and it contains uh, five reports that have applications in multiple sclerosis, dementia, and traumatic brain injury. All of this is built on a strong scientific uh, basis uh, of over 130 publications. Here's just a very uh, quick overview of the reports. We have reports for um, with application in multiple sclerosis, that's IcoBrain MS. One with application in dementia, that's IcoBrain DM. There is a, a version for MRI there and a version for CT. And finally, we have uh, IcoBrain TBI with application in traumatic brain injury. Also there we have a version for MRI and a version for CT. And we have developed all these uh, uh, reports and tools uh, to improve the outcomes of patients with neurological disorders. And that's what drives us at Icometrics. And in, 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 under the engine, uh, in the engine, there is artificial intelligence. And that is exactly the topic of today. And we have uh, the luck to have two speakers on that. Uh, on the, on the, uh, at the first hand, we have Dr. Sorab Jain, uh, who did his PhD at the University of Leuven, and he is uh, today a deep learning scientist and expert at Icometrics. And we are also very honored to have Dr. Lawrence Tannenbaum uh, uh, as a speaker today. Uh, I can uh, unfortunately not tell uh, his whole career, because that would be way too long. He's a, he's a very uh, strong name in the field. He's CTO and Director of Advanced Imaging uh, at RATNET. Uh, he's also uh, Medical Director of the Eastern Region. And he's also, uh, we, have him, uh, we are lucky to have him as President of the Medical Advisory Board. Uh, I keep uh, the further introduction uh, limited to this uh, to allow them to uh, discuss in more detail. So I would la now like to give the word to uh, Dr. Lawrence Tannenbaum. Good morning to everyone. See if I can figure out how to get my slides up here. There we go. So we're going to spend a little bit of time this morning talking about the impact of artificial intelligence in radiology. This won't be one of those seminars that you know talks about deep learning and neural networks. We're really going to give a sense of where the technology is approaching practical application uh, in imaging. And we'll set the tone with a little bit of an overview as to where AI is in society today. So we'll talk a little bit about the hype and reality of AI. We'll talk about its inherent strengths and limitations. And then we'll move on to the impact in terms of scanning and quantitative imaging and reconstruction uh, when we're done with that. So it helps to discuss what AI, what the definition of AI is, and it's a branch of computer science devoted to processes that lets machines do things that are normally associated with human intelligence, such as reasoning, learning, and self-improvement. It's essentially technology that lets machines sense, comprehend, act, and learn. Now, things are moving pretty quickly in this space. Uh, back in 2017, this was the, the classic joke. You know, it was felt to be you know, mostly about hype and that it was very much akin to, to us, the, the, what goes on when teenagers have sex. You know, everyone talks about it. Everyone thinks everyone else is doing it, so they say they're doing it. But really, at the time, nobody really knew how to do it. And things have shifted quite a bit since 2017. You know, at the end of 2019 now, and now, the, as you can see, the program committee for RSNA is made up of all robots. You know, not quite. But on the other hand, you can see that things are certainly moving and 
persisting in this space, you can see that despite the fact that uh, that funding has ramped up quite a bit, it continues to rise quarter by quarter. And perhaps a, you know a really important sign is that this is no longer the sole purvey of small startups and labs. Uh, you can see that there are patents being submitted by the big OEM vendors, you know, in very high numbers. It's known to be one of the key technologies to impact healthcare. You can see that between big data analytics, which really is, you know, in the AI sphere, as well as other forms of AI, you're right at the top of the ladder there in terms of technologies that impact healthcare. Back in 2018, about 50% of healthcare organizations were either actively using AI or actively planning to use AI. And frankly, artificial intelligence applications are all around us. You know, we've, you've seen those creepy ads that follow us around from website to website. Um, you know, Uber, you know, knows where you are. Tinder knows where you've been. It's uh, it's a pretty compelling evidence that this is this technology is everywhere. Yeah, and there have been some fairly flamboyant wins for AI, which you know ideally would exceed human capabilities in beating humans. Uh, this is the famous Go champion uh, looking a little bit down after he lost to a machine. As you know, the uh, autonomous driving is getting closer and closer. The image on the lower left-hand side is is actually a uh, Tesla uh, truck prototype. And, you know, looking at this chart, which is a map of the error rate, you can see that computers are doing better at image reconstruction than humans, and computers have already achieved better results than humans at speech recognition. So things are moving along quite quickly. On the other hand, these technologies are far from perfect. We know that these self-driving systems crash when the humans become inattentive. Uh, and sometimes the human has to override the computer intelligence, like Sully did just outside my window here in New York not too long ago. So really, despite the fact that we hear more and more every day about what AI can do and what AI is already doing, there are still a number of challenges out there, and there still is quite a long way to go. You see these wonderful robots doing wonderful things, yet you give them a challenge they don't anticipate and they fall down. We heard about drivers, and despite the fact that we, we hear so much hype, uh, computers, AI in a sense, is really no more capable at understanding reading than a sixth grade child. So it is, you know, there are definite limitations to what it can do. As a matter of fact, it has real trouble with complex visual scenes. You know, this looks slightly odd to us, and we all can see a rock, and the odds are that computer recognition can see a rock, um, but it doesn't recognize that it's actually a reflection of, of the rock in water that it's looking at, and the trees in the water, rather than the rock floating in space. Again, it can see the bicycle, but it doesn't understand the context that the bicycle is upside down, let alone riding a, riding a bicycle on a lawn. It knows that, you know, this is a cow in the middle of your picture, but it doesn't understand why the cow, it doesn't understand that it's odd that the cow is drinking a cocktail or there's a duck watching TV on the roof, it, but it may recognize a duck and it may recognize a TV. So areas where AI really doesn't do well is in reasoning. It doesn't do well with context. And that's, you know, really the purvey best at this point in, in human hands. Now, I, I, as I said before, and it does remarkably good work with um, image recognition. You know, it does a really nice job telling Dalmatians from, you know, chocolate chip ice cream, let's say. Um, but it does still make flamboyant failures, as in not being able to tell a chihuahua from a blueberry muffin. So um, again, there are still major blunders, and humans are still involved in all of these operations that are very AI intensive, especially when context matters. There's 20,000 content moderators at Facebook, lots of humans working along uh, AI at Google and Twitter, lots of non-engineers uh, giving human intuition in the five, five largest financial institutions that use AI, and lots of humans adding to the censorship that AI is driving in China. By the way, if you want to see, you know, a good illustration of what radiologist's role is in this process, it's in adding context, wisdom, and domain knowledge. Uh, the folks who made this poster in the upper right-hand corner that was posted all over Los Angeles never realized that the brain was in there backwards. And again, that's, you know, domain expertise is critical to, you know, where, where AI is, is, where it's going in its development and perhaps in the future. So to get another sense of where AI fits against human intelligence, in general, it's the you know it's hard problems 
like you know, looking at jillions of CT scans or uh, reams and reams of uh, demographic data, those are very easy for a computer to recognize patterns in. Easy problems, you know, picking up a pencil, walking across a room, uh, recognizing your mother, those are pretty hard. You know, again, it's it's sort of counterintuitive as to what these these machines can actually do. Now, Jeffrey Hinton is a very well-known figure in AI circles. He was actually the godfather of neural networks. And if you know about AI, uh, the big leaps in AI are coming from increased computer power, but also these multi-layer neural networks that simulate, you know, the human brain that can do much more complex processing. So he's the father of this area of, of, of computer science. And he came out with these statements that, you know, radiologists is, radiology is over. They should stop training radiologists. Radiologists are like the coyote chasing the roadrunner. It's already run off the cliff and has no idea. Okay, and that's a pretty pessimistic point of view. So, you know, should we all be worried and running for the hills? Or, you know, as some folks say, is this really the best time to be a radiologist? Now, conventional wisdom these days back, you know, in 2018 is that these computerized tools, computer-associated diagnosis, detection, triage, are all going to make us better radiologists. Um, you know, by incorporating these tools into day-to-day -day practice, we're going to become more efficient. We're going to become more productive, and we're going to spend less time working on drone-like activities that diminish our personal satisfaction and contribute to burnout. Some folks feel this will enable radiologists to leave their offices and become more clinician-facing and more patient-facing, ending up in more conferences, spending more time explaining findings to patients and the like. And certainly some of this will go on. Eric Topol is a very well-known uh, physician in AI circles and in philosophical circles who's written this text, which really points to that same thing, feeling like medicine in our part of the world has gone off the rails and AI is going to let us make uh, healthcare more humanistic again, which uh, I encourage you to read if you're interested in that. So where are we today in 2019? On the left is the number of AI startups. On the right is the number of radiologists who've lost their jobs. So really, you know, I think most of the fear right now has not been realized. And what about Jeffrey Hinton, the expert? Well, you know, he has done a deeper dive on the state of the art in machine learning and artificial intelligence. And he came back with just about the middle of last year, uh, maybe not so fast. Things are not nearly as pessimistic as he laid out. And frankly, I think many of you are familiar with the Gartner hype cycle. It applies to any new technology. You can see where we are in the Gartner hype cycle. Deep learning for images is already starting to go into the trough of disillusionment. We're realizing there are limitations here that we didn't expect. We'll talk about some of those. You can see that deep learning speech is still improving and still increasing in the hype, but deep learning text is just getting started. But notice at the bottom of the left-hand slide, deep understanding, the thing that is the hallmark of human capabilities, uh, it may never actually happen. So the reality is with all the AI that you read about and hear about and, and, the, and that's presented at meetings and the like is that in general, these are narrow capabilities, one trick ponies, so to speak, versus the broad human skills that integrate all the information that's necessary. When these tools go out of their test environment, they tend to behave in a very brittle fashion and often fail You know, when they're not tested again but they're not when they're utilized outside of the neighborhood of their testing environment. There are lots of challenges as to how to get the data and label the data uh, and avoid bias in the data that train these algorithms. You know, once the materials are uh, closer to product, there's concerns over interoperability and how we're actually going to get these tools implemented. And in general, when you look at the VC space, you know, these are individual applications rather than products or companies. So you wonder what's going to happen in this field. Certainly some consolidation will go on. And the economic model to put these into play, you know, is, is challenging. Uh, you know, who pays for this application? If this tool becomes something that makes me work more efficiently and I can do more per day, does that mean I pay for the delta that goes to the AI company? Or is the organization that owns the technical fee that wants to get more productivity and better turnaround times more invested and should they pay for it? There's a lot of outstanding questions out there. But I love this quote from Bill Gates because it gives you a sense of where we are. You know, there is this rushing sense that if we don't turn around, if we, before we turn around, if we don't write guidelines, if we don't get on the bandwagon, we're going to miss, miss the boat. And frankly, I think we're overestimating 
how quick things are changing in the short term. But again, just as Bill Gates says here, and I'm sure others have said as well, you know, before we turn around, you know, it'll be all around us by the next 10 years. And I think cell phone technology for me really brings that message home. You can see um, in 2017, RSNA you know, had a very small footprint for uh, AI. Uh, in 2018, it was, uh, it was a, a sizable portion of the floor. In 2019, it's much, much bigger. And uh, you can see, you know, it's got an entire area devoted to, to uh, AI. Uh, uh, and I encourage you to stop by there and, and take a look. And, and if you're looking for icometrics, just look all around for that little green box. Only kidding. I would suggest you look in the upper right-hand corner. There are a lot of companies out there that are um, involved in uh, medical AI. Uh, I'm sure the minute the slide was made, it was out of date. And frankly, you will see before we're done a lot of some material from a number of these different ventures. Um, and hopefully you'll get a sense of what they're bringing to day-to-day -day work. This is a very nice slide that you Harvey made and, and uh, uh, allows, allowed me to use, which sort of gives you a sense of how artificial intelligence can impact the imaging enterprise. Uh, and you can see everything from the patient record through the uh, report and communication. Uh, you can use this for utilization review and uh, clinical decision support or making multiple versions of a report through natural language processing. Um, what we're going to focus on today is, you know, the, the ones that are closer to the radiologist and the patient, looking at very briefly at automated acquisition using AI, uh, reconstruction techniques that reduce dose and reduce scan time, as well as potentially improve quality. And we'll do, uh, we'll start out with some focus on things like segmentation and quantification, which is really well suited to computers. Now, just to give you some sense, there are automatic scanning tools out there in the market. Some of them have been enhanced by machine learning over the years. The first one to come out and make the claim that it is entirely a new product built on machine learning is the GE product for brain scanning. And it does a remarkable job getting all the individual planes, you know, in a, in a consistent, reproducible fashion. Even some things that are downright remarkable, like getting the optic nerves in the triple oblique position in a way that a human could not possibly do. We actually have been using automated scan technology on a number of our machines for a number of years, and we've had the opportunity to compare the same protocol, same machine, same technologist with and without the automated scanning protocol for the spine. And you can see from this particular chart, the average scan time when we have automated scanning is a few minutes shorter than the ones um, that are done without automatic scanning, just a little more efficient, a little more reproducible, Fewer repeated scans, whatever it is, with a you know after a hundred or so exams on each one, you can certainly see the statistically significant difference in scan time. So you know, with with all of this in mind, you know, I think it's pretty clear that computers are going to, or machine intelligence is make is going to make a pass at our data before we get it. And frankly, one of the greatest areas for this is going to be in quantification tasks, which we struggle with in many ways that machines can do really well. And segmentation tasks as well are really ideally suited to machine learning and artificial intelligence. And really none of us wants to sit there and measure lesions on serial exams in three dimensions, as well as register them and make the interpretation uh, easier. I uh, heard a quote from a colleague who does a lot of liver oncology, who said when he looks at serial exams, it takes him 20 minutes to simply get the images aligned, okay, let alone align the lesions and the like. So this kind of this kind of frustrating drone-like work can be done by computers. So segmentation, as I mentioned, is really one of the lower hanging fruits out there. It's been done almost throughout the entire body. And we're going to focus today on segmentation applications that work in the brain. Uh, you can see how you can segment gray matter. You can segment white matter. You can segment the extraaxial spaces. You can segment even white matter lesions, which can help with your interrogation of certain diseases. Now, the Icometrics product um, for segmentation and quantification uh, has a combination of rules-based uh, inputs, which are refined by neural networks, particularly on the segmentation side, which improve the quality of its work. These are what the Icometrics report looked like, and we'll focus in again in a moment, but it actually gives you some of the things that are either useful for routine clinical surveillance, as well as um, more, um, more uh, erudite and quantitative assessments, which may correlate with outcome, you know, brain white matter volume, gray matter volume, as well as giving us the real comparative to normal populations, 
giving us the perspective on um, what we need in the day-to-day -day work. Now, if you look at the left-hand side of your screen, you'll see an individual patient's exam in 2018. On the right-hand side of your screen, you'll see an individual patient's exam in 2019. And in the middle, you see uh, what the machine intelligence has done to identify, segment, and characterize these lesions. As we go through, notice that the new lesions are in red. That might be you know, a little easier to detect visually, but when you start thinking about in a patient with 30 lesions, which ones are getting bigger, uh, which ones are getting smaller, which ones are staying the same, which ones are new, and what the overall lesion volume is, you can see it goes beyond human capabilities. So the reports actually have you know, lots of detailed information in them. You can see on the right-hand side, we've got whole brain and gray matter volumes. Uh, you can compare, you can get a sense of where it fits in a normative percentile. If you look down at the lower right-hand part of your screen, you see these charts. You see a white X and a black X. Those are two different points in the life of this patient. Uh, and you can see how things are progressing in terms of the volumes. If you, um, if you take a closer look at the um, left-hand side, you can see the volume of flare hyperintensities and T1 hypointensities. How much change has gone on? Looks like the, least, some of the volume of lesions has gone down, even though there are new lesions and some enlarging lesions. So this is really powerful information to be able to deliver to the referring doctor. And again, you know, a little closer view at the interval changes over time and where this fits in terms of where this patient's brain volumes currently fit on a normative percentile. It has been shown in a publication, you see the reference down on the lower left-hand side, that if you use these quantitative tools, you know, these are quantitative and segmentation tools, you get better inter-rater and intra-rater uh, uh, performance, which is really what you want, consistency within your practice, consistency within yourself when you're reporting these examinations. The same paper showed that the diagnosis was changed because of sensitivity uh, and ability to characterize lesions was improved. I think that's very compelling. Um, and clinically, this sometimes led to changes in treatment or would have led to changes in treatment that would have been beneficial for the patient and beneficial for the healthcare system. But again, as a, I think as a key theme when it comes to radiologist uh, and radiology enterprise utilization of these tools, one of the key things that these tools have to be able to do is make us more efficient. And you can see that with the assistance of the machine intelligence, the prepared reports, the lesion highlighting, we, we will get through more reports per day than we could uh, without these tools. And I think that's a key thing to have. So in essence, you get the segmentations, which are easy to easier to interpret, better for communication. You get all the quantitative reports, which can be useful for a number of circumstances, including outcome measures. And, you know, again, on the, on the um, theme of efficiency, you actually can have these findings pre-populated into a report that you can customize and to the institution's uh, preferences and biases. So again, the tool is doing its job in terms of improving care, improving, potentially improving outcomes, but certainly improving efficiency as we go along. So again, I think these points, I think this is really remarkable and real time, real, real time, real, what am I trying to say? Real today applications that you can use um, to affect your practice. Now the same tools are being used for traumatic brain injury as well. And uh, in acute traumatic brain injury, there's a lot of goals. Uh, one is you know, obviously to recognize the, the, the findings, but again, to get quantitative measures of these findings uh, can be very, very helpful because it can correlate with clinical management and perhaps with outcome. It, these tools can actually segment epidural, subdural, and intraparenchymal hemorrhages. It can get measurements of cisternal volume. It can quantify midline shift. It can look at ventricular volume to avoid all of those arguments you have every day, the, the ventricles bigger and smaller. It can also compare to normative populations. And as you can see, it does these nice segmentations. Again, the IcoBrain product here uses neural networks to improve the segmentation uh, and, uh, of these lesions. And here you can see a really nice example, a nice example, but a compelling example for the technology. You see uh, on the right-hand side, we are segmenting um, the hyperdensities, which a radiologist might call hemorrhages. Uh, in the middle, you're actually seeing the cisterns segmented you know, separately from what you see on the left-hand side, which, which are the ventricles, which is no small task. And all of this information is ported into these reports, where it actually will give you the size of the lesion 
give you a quantitative sense if it's enlarging or not. Uh, um, uh, same thing with the ventricles. You know, literature suggests that we can't visually detect a change in ventricle size less than 20%. These tools can be very, very helpful in terms of guiding the surgeons, you know, in intervening in these cases. And again, they pick, they, they quantify and identify and describe the key findings that are important to a lot of the, uh, a lot of the, um, scores that are used in traumatic brain injury. And with these scores, you can actually direct patient management and, uh, or certainly get on the site or understand the way patient management is being done. I'll show you another case again with a different epidural hematoma. Again, you can see the segmentation here of the ventricles of the cisterns and the uh, hyperdensity or epidural hemorrhage in this case. And again, you can see all the quantitative measures that will be reported in this case. I'm going to call your attention to the, to the target in the lower right-hand corner um, because that actually is a really interesting sort of nomogram which can take your eye to certain areas. Um, you can see in this particular case, there's a lot of effacement of the extraaxial spaces caused by the mass effect of, of this hematoma. Again, you know, we can use this to get, you know, to, to use the information to uh, fill out the CT scoring, which then again can actually drive the clinical management. So again, these tools take us one step further. You know, this machine intelligence allows us to get greater value and bridge the gap between where we sit in radiology and where the surgeons sit in terms of decision making and outcomes. I would draw your attention to Alex Wintermark's paper in 2018. You know, at, at our organization, we have the greatest experience uh, with quantitative imaging of the dement of dementias. Uh, as you know, that uh, the dementias have certain volume loss phenotypes. Alzheimer's disease uh, typically is associated with hippocampal atrophy, but also temporal and parietal atrophy with notable sparing of the frontal lobe. If you contrast that to frontotemporal dementia, there is frontal and temporal atrophy predominant, but also hippocampal atrophy, but note the sparing of the parietal lobe. When it comes to vascular dementia, the volume loss is, is not particularly directing, but there are a lot more white matter lesions. And, you know, if a dementia, pa dementia patient presents with no evidence of volume loss, you might be pointing at a, a case of Lewy body dementia. You can see how these, these nomograms that come off of the IcoBrain product really do contribute to a visual sense of where you are. You can see in the middle, the, the black di diamond is right there at the normal volume range. But if you go down to the lower left-hand corner, you'll notice the points of that diamond are all extending outward toward the hippocampi, towards the parietal cortex, towards the temporal cortex. And outward is, you know, in this particular case, is somewhere between the first and 10th percentile. Going over to the right-hand side of your screen, you can see in this case, we're really, you know, vanishingly small frontal cortex. Uh, um, and temporal cortex with uh, some volume loss in other areas as well, not nearly as prominent. So these volumetric dementia signatures, I think, are a hallmark of this product. The other thing you can you get when you do surveillance with these exams, and often the surveillance is really of great value, you can see what's changed. At the previous time point here in, in the dashed white mark, um, there wasn't as much frontal atrophy. It's much worse now. And you can see the hippocampal atrophy is already, you know, was kind of already burnt out. So there really wasn't a lot more room to progress. In our organization, uh, Dr. Susie Bass really leads the, um, the, uh, the generative brain imaging effort, and she loaned me a couple of cases. This is uh, an 86-year-old woman with memory loss. You can see uh, she was seen in 2009. Uh, there is fairly compelling atrophy. There was a PET-CT done, which was then fused to the MR, and you can see with the benefit of fusion, clearly there is bilateral temporal temporal hypometabolism, which is a hallmark of Alzheimer's disease. In 2016, the atrophy is a lot worse. At that point, the quantitative imaging pointed towards um, the uh, hippocampal and temporal, uh, temporal parietal volume loss of an Alzheimer's type dementia. And uh, in 2016, the patient came back. You can see there was you know, a minor amount of interval change with uh, worsening atrophy in some regions. And eventually, this patient had an amyloid at CT. And here you can see there is more amyloid staining of the brain and loss of the gray-white differentiation as a hallmark of Alzheimer's type dementia. This is a case that uh, was loaned to me, a patient who had the clinical suspicion of dementia. If you look at the nomogram, I don't think I give you a chance, or I do give you a chance to see it. You can see it's the frontal cortex that's down around the first percentile. 
and it isn't your typical Alzheimer's disease pattern. And this changed the workup more towards a front frontotemporal dementia. So just a real highlighting of some other areas in the radiology enterprise without nearly as much depth. I think one of the real applications that is taking, taking hold now in a number of institutions is this urgent finding triage where some machine intelligence has gone through the data that's hitting your packs and identified cases you need to read more quickly. Here's a nice example loaned to me from the ADOC folks. Uh, this patient has uh, a small hemorrhage. I probably would have interpreted this as an artifact. You can see it here with the arrow. I don't think I would have identified that. You say, well, who cares? Well, this is what happened when it wasn't identified. And the patient had to go to emergency neurosurgery. So at the very least, getting that case to the top of your pile is very, very useful. Um, and sometimes it can make a difference in the patient's outcome. There are tools out there for pneumothorax. There are tools out there for uh, pulmonary embolism. And another tool that ADOC actually has is it picks up cervical spine fractures. This was not identified. Patient was moving through the department. Um, you know, without a color uh, when it was finally picked up and identified in red uh, with the assistance of the algorithm, uh, the patient was appropriately protected. The other area where we're, all, where we're beginning to see machine intelligence make a difference is in imagery construction. You know, we started out using a form of machine intelligence for compressed sensing. And if you know MR, you know, we've gone from partial zero filling with half neck scanning to, you know, skipping every other line with early uh, uh, parallel imaging to the point where we're doing some really extensive, vastly undersampling and using computer intelligence to fill in the gaps. You know, this type of technology is ubiquitous in our network and frankly has shortened a lot of exams you know, to roughly half of what it used to be beforehand. The same exam that was routinely done in about five minutes is now routinely done at our institutions in two and a half. Uh, iterative reconstruction techniques uh, uh, changed the way that CT was done. Uh, in, in reducing the amount of dose, and there are iterative reconstruction techniques out there like this one from Medic Vision that um, allows you to take an exam, uh, accelerate it to the point where it gets noisy, middle image, and then clean that image up and maintain the image integrity image on the right. So here, in roughly half the scan time, you can see a gorgeous looking image. You know, and that's kind of the work we see with CT. Um, as a matter of fact, you know, CT has been around for a while, but there were complaints about CT image reconstruction. They felt that it was a little too weird, a little too waxy. Uh, there are new versions of it reconstruction available on the market from two different vendors, GE and Canon. Both are marketing machine learning AI-based image reconstructions that more closely emulate the look that we expect from a CT scan, yet still maintain the low dose performance. Um, we're working with one of the big vendors. This is a, a GE product They're looking at true deep learning reconstruction based on raw data for routine brain and spine imaging. It allows you to take an image that looks a lot like a 1.5 on the left and turn it into an image that looks a lot like a 3T on the right. Uh, this is from our research. It takes the image on the left-hand side. This is the same data and turns it into the images in the middle on the right-hand side, which are clearly higher in spatial resolution. It has learned to recognize truncation artifact and eliminate it and certainly the noise, the noise reduction is impressive. Here you can see on, off, on, off, on, left to right across your screen, the PD and the T2. You'll notice the images are cleaner, they're actually sharper, and there's less truncation artifact, largely evidenced by the fact that the cord looks larger. You know, truncation artifact in a sagittal spine image makes everything look a little smaller and a little older. You know, one step beyond this, in my opinion, is uh, the ability to do super resolution. With these tools, you actually train on high resolution data sets, uh, which then can be it, the, the machine learning algorithm, in this case, just recently FDA cleared from subtle MR, can remember what the high res details are. You can then do a really fast, low, S, low resolution scan. But frankly, that's a low spatial resolution scan. Some of our early observations suggest that when you reduce the spatial resolution, you can increase the contrast resolution. But nevertheless, a low spatial resolution scan can be done, saving significant scan time, and then the algorithm can bring that resolution back, is what you see on the right-hand side, a form of super resolution. We actually uh, tested this you know, prospectively in our institution, uh, looking at 3D Flare, and uh, we just submitted these abstracts to the next round of meetings. Uh, and here you see the, the fundamental experiment that we did. On the left-hand side is the routine standard of care scan. On the right-hand side is the accelerated faster scan with lower spatial resolution, maybe better contrast resolution. 
And in the middle is what the artificial intelligence did with the right-hand image. It created a super resolution image with lower noise and perhaps the same low contrast detectability as the low res scan, which sometimes can outperform the high res scan. Here again, you see the experiment. Left-hand side standard of care scan, a little noisy because we're going for an isotropic scan. We dumb it down to go faster on the right-hand side and use machine intelligence to give you the image you have at the top. And you know, I, without giving you all the results, uh, the uh, images with deep learning were superior across the board. So we've covered a lot of things in my time. I probably exceeded it. I'm afraid to look at how long it was, but we hopefully have given you some sense as to where all these things fit and the promise of where we are today and where we're going. Um, again, I think there's a lot ahead of us. And, um, you know, you can't do an AI talk without a few aphorisms. And this is my favorite Yogi Berra aphorism. And, you know, again, if you don't want to, you want to be involved with where the future is going, the best way to do that is to create it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Tannenbaum. Uh, it was a really nice overview with uh, fascinating real world examples. I uh, propose to directly continue uh, to Dr. Jane, uh, who works at Icometrics, uh, for showing the AI in. Uh, Ico Brain. Uh, Sorab, Dr. Jane, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you very much, Dirk. Uh, before we even uh, go into details about uh, how do we, uh, what are the tech uh, methods that we use in Ico Brain, uh, first let us uh, understand the three terminologies which are often used as a synonyms, but this is not correct. Uh, the first thing is artificial intelligence. Uh, it's a it's a can be any technique that helps the computer to make human reasoning. Uh, it can be, for example, domain page uh, knowledge rules that we can use here. In machine learning, there is uh, we do not refine, uh, define these rules very explicitly. The underli uh, underlying model can segment the input image using rules uh, which either are learned from the training data or under a certain model assumption. The first, the former one where we use the training data is uh, called supervised learning and the latter is called unsupervised because we do not use any uh, training data there. In supervised machine learning, uh, we have to define uh, uh, handcrafted features by ourselves. These features helps the model to relate input and output. Uh, for example, these features could be uh, color or texture information. Uh, when the, the complexity of the problem is very high, it's become very difficult to define what kind of features would be beneficial to help the computer to perform its task. And that's where the deep learning comes into picture, where we do not ha have to define any handcrafting of the features. The good thing about uh, deep learning is it can learn those features from the image itself, which are very specific towards a particular task. And the second thing which I would like to also uh, briefly mention first are the three terminologies that are often used is detection, binary segmentation, and multi-class segmentation. In detection, our interest is to define the, the area of interest, which is of uh, what we want. For example, in this case, we are interested in defining uh, where, where are the hyperdensities uh, present in, in this TBI case. In binary segmentation, which is a bit more complex than the detection, that way we are interested in finding the exact contour of this hyperdensity. And here uh, we have to label every single voxel, whether it belongs to a hyperdensity or not. We can even go one step further, where we have to define what kind of hyperdensities we are lo uh, looking for. For example, in this figure, what we are looking at is a subdural hyperintensity and interparenchymal uh, hyperintensity. As you uh, can see, the complexity of the prob uh, of uh, yeah the segmentation or detect uh, goes increase uh, from detection to multi-class segmentation. All right, now I will talk about uh, the uh, the method that we use uh, for IcoBrain for MRI purpose. Uh, in a, uh, we start with uh, we have T1 and a flare image, and uh, we segment the T1 image into its three classes. And three classes here are gray matter, white matter, and CSF. And we uh, segment the hyper intensities in the flare. So there is like a, a magic box everything everyone thinks about. But today we will go through uh, what kind, what is this magic box and how actually it works. 
the magic box is called as the expectation maximization algorithm, and it's an unsupervised machine learning. So just to mention again that in unsupervised machine learning, we do not have to use any training data. Uh, let's go a bit more into detail to understand how expectation maximization algorithm works. In expectation maximization algorithm, we first of all assume that the classes that we want to segment, which is which are here gray matter, white matter, and CSF, have a Gaussian distribution. And what is a Gaussian distribution? It's a, it's a bell shaped curve, which is characterized by uh, the mean and the standard deviation. And since each class has its own Gaussian distribution, it is character, uh, we can see it's a Gaussian mixture model where we have to make sure that uh, the three classes that we, the Gaussian distribution we want to find, still behave uh, that uh, their overall distribution is close to the actual brain histogram. To start the EM, first we have to initialize the priors. Priors are the, the probability or, or to, to start with, where likely that we will find the gray matter, white matter, and CSF in the patient space. And for that, we propagate the, the priors from the MNI space towards the patient space. Next step is called the expectation step. In this step, we calculate the posterior probability for each pixel in an image for each class using the priors that we have calculated in step three and under the assumption that each class can be uh, modeled as a Gaussian distribution. Uh, the next step is called the maximization step where we uh, update our model parameters, which are the mean and the variance for each class using the posterior probability. We iterate between step four and uh, step five till there is no further change in the model parameters. And finally, what we see that we find our Gaussian distribution for the three classes that we are looking for is still very, uh, and still following the overall uh, distribution uh, of uh, brain uh, intensities. And this is how it looks in terms of segmentation. This is the example uh, which, uh, this is the example which is uh, like on, on the, Top row, what we see is the native T1 and flare, and then the bottom, you see the gray matter segmentation on the left and white matter hyperintensities on the right. Uh, it is al always nice that uh, uh, if we re receive a follow up scan of a patient, that the results, especially in the hyper intensity segmentation, are consistent. In cross sectional method or single time code measure, which I just briefly discussed, uh, it's always not uh, uh, always possible that the results are consistent. That's why we have developed a joint uh, white matter, white matter hyper intensity segmentation, which take input uh, 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 the time point one and time point two, both T1 and flare, and jointly uh, refine uh, the segmentation of uh, time point one and time point two to make sure that there is a consistency in the segmentation without compromising on the accuracy part. The underlying model in the joint in the joint hyperintensity segmentation is also SEGEM, and here we model three classes, which are growth class uh, signifying new and enlarging hyperintensity, static class where there is no change between time point one and two, and shrinkage where it's appearing, disappearing and shrinking of the hyperintensity lesion. And just comparing it here, just to give an idea how it has improved uh, from our cross-sectional uh, method or the single time point uh, segmentation, here we see uh, that it has improved a lot in, in giving a consistent result here and also uh, finding actually uh, a hyper intensity which was actually missed at uh, time point one in our, in our cross-sectional measure. So it really helps us to get a consistent result. And this is the, uh, in this slide, uh, which is thing has already been shown, uh, where we see uh, on, on the left is the time point one flare. On the right, we see the time point two flare in between the ICO brain segmentation, where in red is the new lesion, in orange is the enlarging and pre existing in the green. Okay, that was uh, a short introduction on the expectation maximization uh, algorithm and how, how it is being used in uh, ICO brain. Now I will allow, let's dive deep into the ocean and explore the world of deep learning, uh, which is always uh, quite dark, but I will try to explain a deep learning in a very intuitive way. And what would be the best uh, to an, accept an example just to show how the, the deep learning works. For example, uh, let's take an example. We want to build a model, a model which can uh, 
separate, uh, given an image and classify it, whether it's an image of a car or a person or an animal. For any deep learning model, it has to have three characteristics. Uh, it's an input layer, output layer, and something in between, which is called a hidden layer. And the role of the hidden layer is to transform the input towards the output and at the same time learn the meaningful representation from the input itself. For example, in this first layer, the network things like the color, uh, horizontal line, vertical line are uh, useful. And then based on that, it builds more uh, complex uh, features for such as corners and contours. And, and then top, slowly it builds the representation of the object. Uh, and especially the ones which help is to discriminate uh, the different objects itself. Uh, get, looking at how it is being used uh, in IcoBrain, we use uh, a deep learning model in, in our TBI product for CT where we uh, segment the hyperdensities uh, as well as the ventricle segmentation. We start with a 3D uh, T, uh, or 3D CT image, uh, and we then do a convolution with 32 filters, uh, which can be compared from a layer here, and then followed by a 64 filter, which can be compared with uh, the the neurons that you see here, and then we downsample the image and then do convolution. We keep on doing it till we, we reach to the lowest uh, spatial uh, uh, resolution. And then we synthesize back uh, the information towards the aim of doing the final lesion uh, segmentation. Uh, the whole takeaway message from this slide is that during the contracting path, we uh, find features which are, the, uh, uh, are useful not only just to differentiate between the hyperdensities, but also align uh, to synthesize the, the lesion uh, or the hyperdensity information. Uh, yeah. And this is what I just uh, mentioned that we start with uh, uh, a case where we run our model and we uh, get uh, the hyperdensity segmentation, which is in this case, it's a subdural hyperintensity and the interparenchymal hyperdensity. And since it's a multi-class uh, uh, segmentation, it's always uh, a quite challenging task for us. This is an example where we show the ventricle segmentation, the, the left and the, and the right uh, ventricle seg segmentation in different color along with the fourth ventricle, then cistern in between, which I have not covered here because it's uh, not the part of a deep learning at the moment. And then the hyper uh, density uh, one, uh, which, we, uh, which we have just shown. Okay, let's uh, talk about some challenges that we uh, face on a day-to-day -day basis uh, uh, about especially on the clinical scan. The first and the foremost is about the reliability of IcoBrain. Uh, since we receive scan from all over the world, it is very important that our results are very reliable. And we ensure this by doing an extensive validation on different kind of, uh, of uh, data, uh, data sets such that uh, uh, our performance is, uh, is very, very good uh, at the same time. And it has, uh, uh, an impact uh, on, on the on yeah provide valuable information to the clinicians. The second thing which I want to talk about is uh, the problem in doing the brain tissue segmentation uh, in the presence of an abnormality. Uh, here I would like to take an example of uh, of MS. In in MS, when the hyperintensity uh, is present, it has an, an impact uh, on doing the brain segmentation. In order to reduce this effect, uh, we do uh, lesion filling. Uh, and what we do it in, in the lesion filling, in, in lesion filling, uh, we first uh, segment uh, the hyperintensities on flare and, and those corresponding position on a T1, we fill it with the neighborhood white matter intensity. Okay, and the third thing uh, is about the scan alignment of the longitudinal scan. Of course, when the patient goes second time for a follow-up, it, it is not in the same position as the previous time point. Uh, and in order to correct for this, we do the Afrinko registration, which takes care of the uh, rotation, translation, and a little bit of scaling if there is any. Uh, and third, a fourth one is about the generalizability of the model. Uh, deep learning models are often criticized that they do very well on the training data, or on a specific uh, data set. Uh, 
in order to make sure that, uh, that the model that we develop are well generalizable, we use a representative data, both in the training and testing. And by representative, I mean, we take uh, uh, scans from multiple scanner, having wide range of, uh, of protocols along with uh, different uh, disease, uh, disease state or in injury as in case of a TBI. So when it we run on a test case, it really gives a very good indication how well we the model will behave. And last but not the least is about uh, the model interpretability. Deep learning models are often seen as a black box. Uh, we don't know how it is making decision, but it looks very fascinating that it can do very challenging task. Uh, now uh, it's uh, we can have a look at uh, how the network is making a decision uh, with the tools like uh, a saliency maps. And what are saliency maps? Uh, these maps are which can derive using uh, the model. Uh, uh, it can be seen as a heat map, which when we put on the input image, it shows us which part of the image was used to derive the information towards the final segmentation. It already gives a very good idea whether the, the model it has really learned the right features to distinguish among, for example, hyperdensities or for any classification task. So it just uh, helps to understand whether uh, it's, is it, is it a really a meaningful model or not? Uh, with this, I would uh, like to give back the uh, floor to Jack Smith. Thank you. Thank you very much, Saurabh, and thank you for this nice overview of, uh, of uh, how AI helped us in uh, IcoBrain. I would like to also uh, recommend everyone that is joining to subscribe to our newsletter, which you can find on the, uh, on the website uh, by going to icometrics.com.